Elisa Michalovna Kujo, the perfect schoolgirl with unlimited yawn works. Elisa Michalovna Kujo, half Russian and half Japanese. Her grades are top of the school. She's also excellent at sports. And I am at don't yet, there's more. She got long silver hair, mesmerizing blue eyes, exceptionally fair skin, and strikingly gorgeous. She was considered as an idol of her school. Elisa is a student at Sarai Academy. One morning as she walked toward the school, she drew countless admiring glances. Among the admirers was Ando, a second-year student who stopped her in her tracks. He greeted her warmly, commenting on the pleasant morning, but Elisa's response remained impassive. Attempting to look cool, Ando introduced himself and mentioned that her sister had spoken highly of her. He expressed his desire to meet her and suggested they have lunch together. Elisa, maintaining her composed demeanor, declined his invitation. Undeterred, Ando took out his phone and proposed exchanging contact details. Elisa, now slightly annoyed, refused again, stating she had absolutely zero interest in him. Stunned by her bluntness, Ando fumbled with his phone, which fell from his hand. Elisa informed him that she needed to go. However, she paused when she noticed his necklace. Pointing out that it was against school rules, she left Ando standing there, frozen with a pale face. The students who witnessed the exchange were quick to comment. One remarked in awe about how Elisa had effortlessly dismissed Ando, the most coveted guy in school. Another student observed that she clearly had high standards. Elisa entered class 1B, instantly capturing the attention of every student except her benchmate, Kuzma Sachika, who was sound asleep on his chair. Without glancing at him, she greeted him, but her words fell on deaf ears. Elisa kicked his chair hard, causing Kuz to tumble to the floor. She repeated her greeting, questioning whether he had stayed up watching late night and I'm again. Kuz is trying to regain his seat, sheepishly acknowledged his late night activities. Elisa chastised him for sacrificing sleep for Anaheim, only to snooze through school, questioning the point of such behavior. In his defense, Kuz explained that the anime had finished airing at 1 a.m. and that the ensuing episode discussion had taken longer than expected. Elisa, curious, asked if this discussion took place on Twitter. Kuz clarified that he and an Ataka buddy had talked about it on a call for two hours. Elisa, incredulous, asked if he was insane. Kuz mused that if professing love for a particular work with no regard for time or place was the definition of insanity, then he would gladly admit to being insane. Elisa, exasperated, called him stupid instead, to which Kuz responded that she was in rare form that day. Elisa spoke in Russian as Kuz yawned. Surprised and slightly irritated, Kuz looked at her and asked if she had said something. Elisa coldly teased him, implying he looked pathetic. Kuz resigned, turned away, muttering a dismissive response. The introductory chemistry lesson began with the teacher explaining concepts at the front of the class. Hughes sat sleepily in his chair, his eyes half open one moment and closed the next, punctuated by frequent yawns. When he finally dozed off, Elisa poked his waist with her pencil, jolting him awake. Startled, he made a noise and shot up in his seat, raising his hand. All eyes in the classroom turned to him except for Elisa's. The teacher, noticing his sudden alertness, asked if he knew the answer. Hughes still broggy glanced at Elisa for help and whispered an apology. Pressed for an answer, Hughes stood up, struggling to recall the question. He looked at Elisa, who discreetly pointed to the answer number two on her paper. Q's answered with enthusiasm, number two, copper. However, the teacher declared it incorrect. Q's heart sank as he gasped in surprise. The teacher then turned to Cujo, who promptly gave the correct answer, number eight, nickel. The teacher commended Cujo and reminded Q's to pay attention in class. Q's feeling embarrassed, promised to do better, but the teacher admonished him for giving the wrong answer. Q's glared at Elisa, who coldly explained that she had only pointed to the question they were on. Q's sarcastically accused her of pointing to the second choice on purpose. Elisa shot back with a sharp look, denying his claims as lies and slander. Frustrated, Q's urged her to be less obvious next time. Elisa then spoke something in Russian, causing Q's face to blush pink momentarily. He asked what she had said, to which she replied that she had called him stupid. In reality, Q's understood Russian without Elisa knowing. He knew she had actually said that he is cute. This wasn't the first time he had heard her say similar things before. Internally, Kuz fumed, knowing she thought he was clueless. As Elisa spoke in Russian again, commenting on how red his face was like a baby's, Kuz's face turned pink once more. He internally protested, wondering who she was calling a baby and feeling increasingly exasperated by the situation. Kuz reminisced about his childhood, recalling the Russian girl who lived near his grandpa's house. It was during those days that he picked up the language and found he could still understand spoken Russian quite well. Now he found himself in an unexpected situation. A cute Russian girl beside him, Elisa, would often fawn over him in Russian, thinking he didn't understand a word. Imagining Elisa's face turning beet red and her fainting if he ever revealed his secret understanding, 
Kuz quickly dismissed the idea. There was no way he was going to admit it now. At 9.50, it was time for a break. Hughes began checking his phone, prompting a reminder from Elisa about the school's ban on mobile phone use except in emergencies or for reference. Kuz, undeterred, declared his situation an emergency because his free rolls in a game were ending in 10 minutes. Elisa, incredulous and exasperated, remarked on his audacity, especially given her position as a student council officer. In a burst of excitement, Kuz exclaimed about his imminent acquisition of the rare character, SSR Tsukuyomi. Reacting swiftly, Elisa stood on her desk and seized his phone. Kuz protested loudly, but Elisa took a moment to scrutinize the screen. She noted the silver-haired, kimono-clad figure and questioned why Tsukuyomi, a goddess of the moon in Japanese mythology, had silver hair instead of jet black. Kuz shrugged off the details, focusing on the character's cuteness. Returning his phone, Elisa received an exuberant thanks from Kuz, who internally celebrated his successful role. Elisa then muttered in Russian about her own silver hair, feeling a pang of jealousy. When Kuz gasped in surprise and asked her to repeat herself, Elisa coldly referred to him as a game junkie. Kuz, taking offense, retorted that as a free-to-play F2P player, he shouldn't be labeled alongside pay-to-win P2W players or whales. Elisa acknowledged his point with a biting comment, adding that no one would want to be categorized with him. Kuz was eating lunch with his friends Takeshi Mariyama and Hikaru Kiyomiya in the school cafeteria. Mariyama, in a state of melodramatic despair, lamented his lack of success with the ladies, while Kiyomiya asked Kuz about his meal. Kuz replied that he was eating super spicy mappo ramen, ignoring Mariyama's heartfelt complaint. Kiyomiya chuckled, seeing it as just another one of Mariyama's usual outbursts. Mariyama, feeling dejected, commented on Kuz's apparent indifference. Suddenly, a commotion arose as Elisa, Maria Mikhailovna Kujo, and Suyuki entered the cafeteria, drawing everyone's attention. Maria, the student council secretary, and Su, the student council spokesperson, looked around for seats. Elisa expressed concern about finding a place to sit, but Maria reassured her and decided to sit with her classmates. Kiyomiya and Mariyama admired the Kujo sisters, noting their beauty and speculating about Maria's relationship status. Mariyama wished he could get to know Maria better, but was disheartened by rumors that she had a boyfriend. Hughes bluntly remarked that Mariyama had no chance regardless, and Mariyama retorted, envious of Kuz's close relationship with Elisa. Hughes admitted that Elisa often snapped at him, but Mariyama pointed out that it was better than being ignored, as she rarely talked to anyone else. Mariyama mused about his chances with Sue, deeming her more approachable than Elisa, though still out of most guys' league. Kiyomiya doubted Sue's availability given her history of turning down many suitors. Mariyama speculated that she might already be promised to someone due to her wealthy background and asked Hughes if he knew anything. Hughes, slurping his ramen, dismissed the question. As Sue and Elisa continued to look for seats, Sue approached Kuz's table and asked if she could sit there. Kuz agreed and checked with his friends, who nervously consented. Sue joined them, noting that she had ordered the same dish as Kuz. Elisa took a seat opposite Sue, next to Mariyama, who was surprised by Sue's taste for spicy ramen. Sue insisted he drop the formality, as they were in the same year, and mentioned her fondness for ramen. Kuz cooled his ramen and slurped it, agreeing with Sue's remark that the dish could be spicier. Sue joked about suggesting chili oil to the student council, but Kuz protested against mixing personal preferences with administrative matters. Sue laughed, revealing it was just a joke. Elisa watched their interaction with a cold gaze and asked if they were friends. Sue explained that they had known each other since preschool. Kuz then asked the girls if they were friends, and Sue expressed her desire to be friends with Elisa, who shyly admitted she wasn't entirely opposed to the idea. Feeling overwhelmed, Mariyama and Kiyomiya excused themselves, citing the intensity of the situation. Shu then moved closer to Kyu's and asked if he had considered her offer to join the student council. Kyu's reiterated his lack of interest, but Sue insisted he would be a great fit, noting his experience as vice president in middle school. Eliza, surprised, learned that Sue had been the president while Kyu's had been her vice president. Sue praised Kyu's capability despite his self-deprecation. Eliza, looking away, muttered in Russian that she already knew, then sipped her Oshiruko. As they walked through the school alley, the trio eventually parted ways. Sue left first, leaving Elisa and Kuz alone. Elisa, somewhat taken aback, questioned their close relationship, revealing her surprise that Sue would want to be friends with Kuz. Kuz, perplexed by her astonishment, pointed out that there was already a girl who considered herself his friend, referring to Elisa herself. This realization hit Elisa, and she hesitated before affirming their friendship. Acknowledging that they were indeed friends, Elisa abruptly remembered an errand at the student council office and took her leave. As she walked away, Kuz shouted after her, confused by her sudden departure. 
Internally, Elisa smiled, pleased by the confirmation of their friendship, which warmed her heart despite her typically reserved demeanor. Kuz dreamt about his childhood, remembering a time when he ran to meet a Russian girl to watch the sunset. They spoke in Russian, and before parting, she kissed him. Waking up, he lamented that despite studying Russian diligently to converse with her, he couldn't recall her name. Arriving at school early due to day duty, Kuz entered the classroom and started cleaning. He organized the chairs and cleaned the blackboard. When Elisa arrived, they exchanged greetings. Elisa was surprised at Kuz's early arrival, teasing him about it. Kuz, noticing her socks were dirty, inquired if she had stepped in a puddle. Elisa explained that a truck had splashed her on the way to school, but she had spare socks. Elisa then questioned Kuz about his past involvement with the student council alongside Sue, hinting at whether he joined again. Kuz dismissed the idea, stating he wasn't interested. Elisa seemed to want to say something but changed her mind, then asked Kuz to fetch her spare socks from her locker since she had taken off her dirty ones. Kuz reluctantly agreed, fetched the socks, and handed them to her. Elisa asked him to put the socks on for her. Kuz was taken aback, stammering in surprise, but Elisa insisted it was a small favor in return for his help. He reluctantly began to put the sock on her foot, but an accidental brush against her private area caused both of them to recoil in shock. Elisa kicked him away and Kuz fell to the ground. Elisa sulked afterward, leaving Kuz to wonder about her strange displays of affection in Russian and their peculiar dynamic. Kuz found himself in a difficult situation after an awkward encounter with Elisa. Kuz tried to apologize through messages, but failed. During a break, he approached Elisa asking for forgiveness. Elisa, initially cold, admitted she wasn't mad anymore and apologized for kicking him. Kuz flustered by the situation and assured her that he was fine despite her concerns about his neck. His attempt at a playful remark backfired when he inadvertently hinted at seeing something he shouldn't have, prompting Elisa to punch him hard and storm away. Kuz chased her through the school corridors and stairs. After 10 minutes chasing around, they both exhausted. Kuz sincerely apologized again, offering her Oshiruko as a peace offering. Elisa, initially suspicious of his motives, eventually accepted it, pretending she was thirsty. Elisa muttered in Russian again that have meaning offering a sip. Knowing what it meant, Kuz felt inner turmoil. But he chickened out and acted as he usually did. Kuz knocked on the student council room's door and called out for Sue. He found Sue arranging the shelves, who thanked him for coming. Kuz asked what it was about and Sue suggested starting with some pleasantries, playfully having Kuz apologize for making her wait. They both acted cute, causing Elisa, who was also in the room, to comment on their closeness. Kuz, surprised to see Elisa, felt a bit awkward and guilty. Shuv had set Kuz up to help sort out everything in storage. As Kuz arranged the boxes, Sue asked for his help to get a box from the top shelf. Kuz climbed a ladder and handed Sue a box of board games and cards, which Sue mentioned were used for school festival events and a recent student council get-together, where she had technically won. Elisa, annoyed by their conversation, reminded them to focus on work. Sue excused herself, leaving Kuz and Elisa alone. Elisa spoke in Russian, asking for attention and beckoning Kuz to come closer. Kuz, understanding her words but pretending not to, gasped internally, shocked by her boldness. Elisa, with a grin, thought he had no idea she was throwing herself at him. Elisa repeated her words in Russian, adding a rhyme this time. Sue, watching their interaction from a distance, wondered what was going on between them. The three of them gathered after their task was completed. Sue commended Kuz on his work, and Elisa thanked him for his help. Kuz responded simply, feeling a bit awkward. Just then, Kenzaki, the student council president, appeared and noted their progress. Elisa mentioned that Kuz had helped them out, which led Kenzaki to introduce himself to Kuz. Kenzaki expressed how he had heard a lot about Kuz's talents, making Kuz feel slightly flattered and acknowledging Kenzaki's impressive aura. As Kuz was about to leave, Kenzaki stopped him, offering to buy him dinner as a thank you for his help. Kuz tried to politely refuse, appreciating the gesture, but not wanting to impose. However, Sue encouraged him to accept, noting that he wouldn't have dinner ready for him at home anyway. Kenzaki, curious about Sue's knowledge of Kuz's home situation, learned that Sue and Kuz went way back. With that, Kenzaki extended the dinner invitation to both Sue and Elisa. Sue accepted graciously and Elisa agreed as well. Kuz, surprised by the turn of events, reluctantly went along with it. At a royal fast food restaurant, Kenzaki sat beside Sue, while Kuz found himself next to Elisa. Kenzaki commented on how affordable a casual dinner meal was, prompting an awkward laugh from Kuz. Kenzaki expressed his surprise at their quick work, noting he expected the task to take until the next day. Sue praised Kuz, highlighting his ability to handle both physical labor and paperwork effortlessly, as well as his skills as an MC and negotiator. Kuz, feeling embarrassed, asked Sue to tone down the praise. 
Kenzaki, noting that Shu rarely gave such high praise, asked if Q's had any interest in joining the student council. Q's declined, explaining he had enough of student council work in middle school. Kenzaki acknowledged the workload but pointed out the significant benefits, especially regarding recommendations. Despite this, Q's insisted he wasn't motivated by such opportunities. Sue pleaded with him to join her in running for office again but Q's was adamant insisting she didn't need him since she was likely to become the next president anyway. Kenzaki corrected Q's, pointing out that Sue had competition, particularly from Elisa. Q's looked at Elisa's surprise. Elisa confirmed she would be running against Sue next year. Their meals arrived and they ate together. After finishing, they gathered in front of the restaurant before parting ways. Kenzaki and Sue headed in one direction while Kenzaki suggested that Q's walk Elisa home. Q's agreed. As they walked side by side, Elisa tried to play coy, suggesting Q's didn't need to walk her. Q's dismissed this, knowing she wouldn't be left to walk alone. Q's then asked Elisa if she was serious about running for student council president. Elisa confirmed, reiterating what she had said earlier. Upon reaching an alley intersection, Elisa told Q's she would be fine from there and thanked him. They exchanged farewells and each went their separate ways. Q's arrived home, greeted unexpectedly by Sue. She welcomed him back and asked if he had walked Elisa home. Puzzled by her presence, Q's inquired why she was at his house. Sue nonchalantly informed him that she was staying over for the night, much to Q's surprise. Sue, engrossed in a manga titled Teach Me How to Love 2, muttered to herself about the plot, trying to decipher the relationship between the characters. She speculated that an unknown hot guy walking with the heroine had to be her older brother, a conclusion she found obvious yet frustratingly elusive to the protagonist. Q's, glancing away, commented on Sue's irony in pretending to be his childhood friend at school. Sue defended herself, asserting that it wasn't a lie. She explained that a childhood friend could also be a sibling or an otaka buddy. She argued that these roles could coexist in constantly evolving language. Ku sighed as Sue continued reading her manga. Suddenly, Sue exclaimed in surprise, realizing the hot guy was indeed the heroine's big brother. Q's remark on the classic trope and Sue confirmed it with excitement, noting that the brother was now kissing the heroine. Q's taken aback questioned the scenario, suggesting they might be step-siblings. This angered Sue, who grabbed Q's by the collar and emphatically declared that it was only good when they were blood-related, leaving Q's bewildered by her passionate outburst. In the morning, Q's was fast asleep in his bed when Sue came in with a playful tone to wake him up. She teased him, saying she was bringing him love and warmth. Q's, still half asleep and annoyed, rumbled that his morning had stopped being good the moment she woke him up. Sue, enjoying the teasing, continued to joke, but Q's insisted it was more like being bothered. She even playfully threatened to scare him by hiding under his bed next time. Q's sighed, wondering what she was trying to achieve, and told her to get off his bed. Sue, still in a playful mood, kept teasing him until he firmly told her to stop. Q's and Sue, the siblings, decided to go shopping. As they passed by a theater, Q's noted a display for an animated movie. Sue, however, was visibly thrilled about the film, especially enjoying the exclusive moments not shown in the TV series. Her excitement made her shout with enthusiasm, insisting on watching the movie again. Q's had to drag her away, reminding her that they were supposed to be shopping. At the store, Sue picked out his summery dress she had been eyeing but lamented about her dwindling funds due to merchandise purchases. Q's was shocked at the price tag and made a comment about the high cost of women's fashion. Meanwhile, Q's sensed someone following them and mentioned it to Sue, who had already noticed the presence of a familiar person. It turned out to be Elisa, hiding and observing them. Sue approached her with a composed expression, addressing her politely. Q's, realizing they were discovered, followed Sue's lead and greeted Elisa. Elisa awkwardly admitted she had seen them earlier, but didn't find the right moment to say hello. Both Q's and Sue internally questioned her timing. When Sue invited Elisa to join them for lunch, Q's intervened, concerned about the restaurant they had planned to visit. Sue, with a cute expression, didn't see the issue and explained their plans to Elisa, who, seeing it as a challenge, agreed to join them. Despite Kuz's warnings about the super spicy ramen the restaurant served, Elisa decided to come along, not wanting to back down. Kuz, Sue, and Elisa arrived at the entrance of Hell's Cauldron, a restaurant with a theme emphasizing the extreme spiciness of its dishes. The black and red decor caught Elisa's attention, and she hesitated for a moment, taking in the bold name and atmosphere. Despite her initial shock, she resolved to stay. Inside, the trio was greeted and seated. Elisa scanned the menu, which featured intimidating names like Pool of Blood Hell, Pink Christian Hell, and Infinite Hell. Sue explained each dish, noting that the Pool of Blood Hell with its bright red soup was the least spicy, while the other two increased in intensity. Elisa opted for the Pool of Blood Hell, and Kuz and Sue followed suit. 
As they waited for their food, Elisa commented on Sue's casual attire, expressing surprise. Sue casually mentioned having spent the morning with Kuz, borrowing his shirt, which led to Elisa's shock reaction and Kuz's awkward attempts to explain the situation. When the Raymond arrived, his fiery appearance made Elisa gasp. Despite her determination, the intense heat quickly overwhelmed her. She struggled to eat, her chopsticks falling from her grasp as her face darkened with discomfort. Kuz noticed her distress and tried to reassure her, but Elisa insisted she was fine. Knowing she was suffering, Kuz grew more concerned as Sue mischievously suggested adding even more spice with the restaurant's devil's tear seasoning. Elisa, not wanting to back down, decided to try it despite Kuz's warnings. Trembling, she added a drop to her ramen and forced herself to take a bite. The overwhelming heat made her scream in pain, confirming Kuz's fears. Kuz and Elisa found themselves alone in the park, with Sue having run off for some errand. Kuz, concerned for Elisa, checked if she was feeling okay after their intense Raymond experience. Elisa dismissed his concerns but seemed unsettled. Noticing an ice cream stall nearby, Kuz suggested getting some, to which Elisa readily agreed. Elisa opted for a triple stack of ice cream, while Kuz chose a single scoop. As they enjoyed their treats, Kuz broached the topic of Elisa's ambitions. He asked why she wanted to be student council president, to which she responded with a simple desire to aim higher. Kuz inquired about her running mate, and Elisa mentioned she didn't have one but planned to find someone to fill the role. She spoke softly in Russian, hinting at a deeper desire for support, which Kuz understood. Memories of Sue crying in middle school flashed in Kuz's mind, deepening his empathy for Elisa. She then asked about his plans for the rest of the day. Kuz had none, and Elisa suggested he help her with clothes shopping. Kuz hesitated, pointing out that a guy helping a girl shop for clothes implied a close relationship. Elisa, unfamiliar with such social nuances, found his concern puzzling. Realizing that Elisa might not have many friends to go shopping with, Kuz agreed to help, emphasizing their friendship. Elisa seemed slightly unsettled by the term but accepted his offer. Kuz and Elisa found themselves in a store with Elisa feeling puzzled and slightly irritated by Kuz's sudden kindness. She wondered if he doubted her chances of becoming student council president and felt a surge of determination. As Elisa picked out a dress and headed to the changing room, she resolved to impress Kuz. She called out for him to move farther away, worried he might hear her changing. Kuz complied, waiting patiently outside. Elisa put on the elegant dress, admiring herself in the mirror. She felt confident but also nervous about Kuz's reaction. When she finally stepped out, other shoppers admired her appearance and Kuz was no exception. He praised her, saying the outfit enhanced her elegance and femininity, making her look even prettier than usual. Elisa was taken aback by his compliment, not expecting such words from him. Inside the changing room, Elisa felt a mix of surprise and satisfaction. Meanwhile, outside, Kuz was shocked at his own words, feeling a rush of embarrassment. Observers in the store found their interaction endearing, mistaking them for a teenage couple. Elisa tried on various outfits, each time stepping out to show Kuz. With each change, Kuz's compliments flowed, cool, lovely, sexy, pretty. Elisa relished the praise, feeling a thrill she hadn't anticipated. She became bolder, selecting a more revealing outfit, confident Kuz would appreciate it. However, when she revealed the daring outfit, Sue had returned, catching Elisa by surprise. Sue teased Elisa, who quickly retreated to the changing room, overwhelmed with embarrassment. She muttered in Russian that she wanted to disappear. Sue, curious, asked Kuz what she said, and he translated highlighting Elisa's flustered state. Sue's response was a mix of amusement and mockery, adding to Elisa's embarrassment. As the train carried them home, Elisa sat with Kuz and Sue, still feeling the sting of her earlier embarrassment. Her pale complexion betrayed her thoughts, replaying the scene in her mind. When the train pulled into a station, Kuz and Sue stood up to leave. With casual farewells, they bid Elisa goodbye. Kuz mentioned seeing her on Monday, while Sue remarked on how much fun the day had been, suggesting they hang out again soon. Elisa agreed, masking her internal turmoil with a forced smile. Internally, she berated herself for her bold choice of outfit, fearing they might judge her harshly. As the train doors closed behind Kuz and Sue, Elisa suddenly realized they had both gotten off at the same station. Confusion flickered across her face as she processed this unexpected detail. She questioned why they would disembark together, a sense of unease creeping in as she pondered the implications. Elisa arrived home and slipped off her shoes. Her sister and Masha greeted her with a warm hug, expressing her delight at Elisa's return. Elisa placed her bag on the table while Masha, sitting on the floor and hugging her teddy bear, noticed something was off about her sister's demeanor. Elisa stood by her desk, trying to dismiss Masha's concerns, but Masha saw through her facade. Reluctantly, Elisa admitted she had met Kuz Khan at his childhood friend. Masha couldn't help but tease her sister, 
noting how Lisa seemed to react strongly whenever Q's cum was mentioned. Masha's teasing smile and insinuations about Elisa's feelings for Q's cum made Elisa defensive. She insisted there was nothing romantic between them and that they were merely friends. Masha, however, pressed on curious about how Elisa, who usually dislike indifferent slackers, had become friends with him. Six years ago in Vladivostok, young Elisa was an enthusiastic elementary school student. One day, her teacher assigned the class a group project. They were to write a detailed report on local businesses, and the best report would earn a prize. Elisa and her classmates quickly organized themselves into groups and divided the tasks. Elisa's group assigned her to visit the florist and the butcher, while another student took on the clothes boutique and bakery. Elisa, determined to excel, committed herself fully to the project. Elisa set off to gather her information, visiting the florist first. She explained her school project to the shopkeeper, who provided her with all the necessary details. She then moved on to the butcher shop, where she collected further information to complete her portion of the assignment. When the group met the next day to compile their findings, Elisa discovered that her classmates had not started their tasks. They assured her there was plenty of time left, but Elisa knew that writing a comprehensive report would be time-consuming and urged them to start immediately. Her classmates, however, were unconcerned, thinking the assignment was simple enough to complete at the last minute. They were amused by Elisa's detailed notes and essays, considering her effort excessive. Elisa questioned why her group wasn't taking the project seriously. Her insistence on the importance of the work led to tensions within the group. Eventually, one classmate suggested that if she was so concerned, she should just do the project on her own. Despite the teacher's attempts to mediate, Elisa found herself working alone. When the day of the announcement arrived, the best report was awarded to another group. Elisa felt sad as she looked at the report she had worked on alone. Walking home, she reflected on how things might have been different if her classmates had taken the project as seriously as she did. Realizing that expecting the same dedication from others was unrealistic, she resolved to rely on herself in the future. If she wanted something done well, she would have to do it all by herself. Elisa was transferred to Sarai Academy and on her first day, she found herself sitting in the last seat of the classroom. Her new classmates quickly gathered around her, curious about the newcomer. They asked if it was true that she had passed the notoriously difficult transfer exam and she confirmed with a humble acknowledgement. They also complimented her Japanese, asking if she had lived in Japan before, to which she explained that she had lived there until five years ago. The school bell rang, signaling the start of class, and her classmates returned to their seats. Elisa noticed that the boy next to her, Qs, was still sleeping despite the noise. Surprised, she wondered how he could sleep through such a racket. Gently, she tried to wake him, reminding him that the warning bell had rung. Kuz woke up lazily and recognized Elisa as the transfer student who had given a speech at the opening ceremony. Introducing herself as Elisa Mikhailovna Kujo, she received a friendly introduction in return from Kuz Masachika. Kuz then turned to his friend Hikaru Kiyomiya, who sat in front of him and struck up a conversation, surprised to see him in the same class. Hikaru informed him that Takeshi Maruyama was also in their class, leading Kuz to acknowledge Takeshi's presence as well. Before science class, Elisa was heading to attend when she overheard Kuz speaking with his friends. Kuz had forgotten his textbook and was asking Hikaru if he could share, which Hikaru agreed to do. Later, during PE class, Elisa noticed Kuz running slowly and unmotivated, lagging far behind the other students. His lack of enthusiasm stood out in sharp contrast to the rest of the class. In math class, Elisa saw Kuz asleep on his desk. She couldn't help but think that slackers existed everywhere, even in prestigious schools like Sarai Academy. With the school festival starting in 14 days, Elisa's class had decided to create a haunted house. The students were busy planning, discussing the need for shutters to make paths and costumes for the ghosts. Takeshi and Hikaru tried to manage the chaos while other students expressed their surprise at the amount of work involved. As the afternoon ticked away, nearing 5.30 p.m., Elisa remained in the classroom, diligently sewing costumes for the festival. Her classmates began to leave, one of them asking if she was going home yet. Elisa replied that she would continue working for a while longer. They wished her well and left, discussing their doubts about finishing the project on time and questioning the necessity of getting worked up over a school festival. Elisa couldn't help but think, it's happening again. She pricked her finger on the sewing needle, adding another bandage to her already covered fingers. Despite the pain, she was determined to do her best and not give up. Her resolve was clear. If it meant working alone, so be it. Suddenly, Qs appeared at the classroom door. He acknowledged her dedication and suggested she go home, assuring her that they could tackle the tasks together the next day. Elisa, intent on finishing more work, was surprised when Qs mentioned that the Handicrafts Club had agreed to help with the costumes. He had even secured permission for them to stay overnight at school, an event he hoped would motivate their classmates. 
Cruz revealed he had asked the former student council president to assist and had made a deal with the Handicrafts Club, promising the boys would help with their work in exchange for their support. He urged Elisa to call it a day, pointing out there was no point in her working alone. Elisa, feeling a mix of frustration and determination, stood up and expressed her desire to create a high-quality attraction without compromising. She acknowledged that her efforts might seem egotistical, but felt justified in taking on the workload since she believed no one else cared as much as she did. Cuse gently pointed out that her efforts might be misdirected. He emphasized that school festival attractions were meant to be collaborative efforts, suggesting that Elisa should focus on motivating the entire class instead. Elisa was taken back but listened as Cuse apologized, appreciating her hard work. Feeling conflicted, Elisa gathered her belongings and left the classroom. As she walked down the school hallway, Cuse's words echoed in her mind, leaving her to ponder his perspective and her approach to the project. Takashi led the class in preparing the haunted house for the school festival, organizing an overnight session to ensure everything was ready. He enthusiastically announced their plans to work on the festival setup, all incorporating fun activities like hide-and-seek and test-of-courage sessions on school grounds. His energy was contagious, and the students responded with enthusiastic cheers. Standing at the back, Elisa watched in awe as her classmates threw themselves into the project with spirited determination. The entire class worked diligently on the haunted house. Female students brought snacks to keep everyone energized, while male students focused on constructing materials. Takeshi busily examined the progress and coordinated efforts among his classmates. Elisa practiced wearing the ghost costume which fit her character perfectly, earning admiration from her classmate. Finally, the day of the festival arrived and Class 3B proudly presented their haunted house. Their hard work paid off as they won the Best Attraction Award in the Class Event category. After the festival, the students gathered on the sports field for a dance, pairing up male and female students. Cuse was sitting alone when Elisa approached him. Cuse commented on how old-fashioned it was for the school to hold a folk dance for the after-party. Elisa asked if she could sit beside him and he wondered why she wasn't dancing, assuming everyone wanted to dance with her. Elisa, with a hint of pride, mentioned her ballet practice from childhood, which made the simplistic dance easy for her, but she turned everyone down, saying she couldn't be bothered. Cuse remarked that fighting off invitations must have been a pain, but Elisa replied that she was used to it. He then mentioned that others had started calling her the Ice Princess, to which Elisa responded with displeasure. She clarified that it wasn't the loner implication that bothered her, but the princess part, which she felt made her sound like a snob. She expressed her frustration that her efforts were often overshadowed by her looks and talents. Cues understood and promised not to call her that. Elisa thanked him and admitted that he was right about teamwork, acknowledging that she wouldn't have experienced the festival in the same way if she had tried to do everything alone. She also apologized for lashing out at him previously. Cues brushed off her apology, downplaying his contributions compared to hers and Takeshi's. However, Elisa insisted on repaying him in a tangible way. After some thought, Kuz asked if he could call her by a special Russian nickname, something personal. Elisa revealed that her family called her Alia. Kuz requested permission to call her Alia, seeing it as a unique privilege. Elisa was surprised but questioned what he gained from it. Kuz explained that as the class idol, being the only guy to call her by a nickname would be special. Elisa found his enthusiasm amusing yet perplexing, while Kuz expressed his gratitude for the glorious gift. Three male students approached her with requests to dance. Each student vied for her attention, with one asking politely, another expressing his long-standing interest, and a third complaining about the unfairness of the situation. Despite their persistent pleas, Elisa declined their offers, stating she couldn't dance. However, the students continued to press her, encouraging her to simply move with the music and assuring her that she would be fine. Cues, observing the commotion, decided to intervene. He took Elisa's hands and, with a confident gesture, informed the boys that she was already taken and guided her away from the crowd. Elisa, surprised by his bold move and feeling her heart race, made a half-hearted protest, but found herself unable to pull away. As they reached the dancing area, Cuse reminded Elisa of her earlier claim that her ballet training would make folk dancing easy for her. He challenged her to demonstrate her skills, addressing her with the nickname Princess as a playful taunt. Elisa accepted the challenge. The next morning, Cuse was sleeping at his desk. When he woke up, he saw Elisa watching him with a displeased look. Cuse greeted her but was confused by her stern gaze. Elisa, clearly annoyed, called him a waste of space. Cuse was surprised by her harsh words, while Elisa quietly reflected in Russian, remembering how she had admired him the night before. At the present moment, Elisa finished recounting to Masha how her friendship with Cuse began. Masha listened intently, reflecting on Elisa's story with an understanding nod. She noted that Elisa's experience sounded like the start of a lovely romance, which led her to believe that Elisa might have developed deeper feelings for Cuse. 
Aliza, however, insisted that their relationship was purely friendly and was frustrated by Masha's romantic interpretation. She emphasized that her trust and appreciation for Q's were based on his capabilities and reliability. Masha, in turn, shared her own experiences, drawing a parallel to her past relationship with someone who had similarly impressed her with his actions. Aliza, growing increasingly irritated, asked Masha to save her love life stories for another time, not wanting to hear more comparisons. Masha playfully protested for dismissing her sentiments. Q's entered the student council office, where Kenzaki, the student council president, was working. Kenzaki welcomed him and acknowledged Kuzi's assistance, noting that he was covering her sister, Yuki. Masha was also present. She introduced herself as Elisa's older sister and the student council secretary. She extended a warm greeting to Kuz, expressing her friendliness toward any friend of her sister's. Kuz, acknowledging Masha's kindness, addressed her as Masha-san. Masha enthusiastically took Kuz's hand in both of hers, but then paused, puzzled by his given name. Kenzaki, with a hint of humor, suggested that there might be something unusual about Q's. Q's playing along made a witty remark in response. Masha, realizing her mistake, quickly withdrew her hand and apologized for her overly enthusiastic greeting. She was just excited to meet someone who was important to her sister. Q's, somewhat taken aback, listened as Masha spoke in Russian, asking if they should proceed. Confused by the foreign language, Q's asked for clarification. To which Masha apologized and translated her question into Japanese. With the plan set, Masha bade farewell to Kenzaki and led Kyu's out of the office. Kyu's and Masha went shopping together, with Kyu's carrying two bags. Masha eagerly suggested getting a plushie that looked like Alia, but Kyu's thought it was more suited for a personal room. Despite his concerns, Masha chose a plushie that resembled the student council president, a bespectacled lion. Masha also decided to buy a cape plushie for herself, keeping it on a separate receipt to avoid bothering Alia. As they left the store, Kuz thought about how much patience Alia must have had with her sister's lively personality. At the tea shop, Masha asked Kuz for his opinion on a sample tea, but Kuz wasn't sure. He remembered his sister Yuki and their family issues. Masha noticed Kuz's distress and hugged him comfortingly, but accidentally spilled hot tea on his back. Kuz and Masha entered the student council office, where the atmosphere was calm and organized. Masha clutched a cute white plushie in her hands, holding it close as if it were a treasured possession. The student council president, Kenzaki, sat at his desk, glancing up as they approached. Masha and Kuz announced their return, catching Kenzaki's attention. His gaze fell on the plushie Masha was holding. It was undeniably adorable, and Masha's affection for it was clear. Kenzaki commented on the plushie's cuteness, but he hesitated at the thought of it staying in the office. Masha, sensing his reluctance, pleaded with Kenzaki to reconsider, her tone earnest and hopeful. She was eager to find a place for her beloved plushie. Kuz placed the supplies on the table, feeling a sense of accomplishment. He had gathered everything needed, ensuring the student council office would run smoothly. Kenzaki, the student council president, inspected the items and expressed relief. He remarked that the supplies were ordinary but crucial, and he humorously suggested that if left to her own devices, Elder Kujo Masha might have turned the office into a plushie-filled theme park. Kuz, envisioning Masha surrounded by cute animal plushies, couldn't help but smile at the thought. The playful image contrasted with the more serious nature of their duties. Kenzaki, shifting the conversation, inquired if Kuz had reconsidered joining the student council, noting that he was always welcome to contribute, even occasionally. Masha chimed in, suggesting that Kuz join on paper. Kenzaki was pleased with this idea, addressing Masha as Elder Kujo and expressing his support for Kuz's involvement. Kuz, however, felt uneasy about the suggestion, questioning why both Masha and Kenzaki were so eager for him to join. He voiced his concerns, admitting that he didn't feel worthy of being a student council officer, reflecting on his previous experience as a vice president in middle school. That experience had shown him that he lacked the ambition to use such a position for meaningful change. Kenzaki disagreed, sharing his personal story to challenge Kuz's doubts. He revealed that his initial motivation for becoming student council president was to win the heart of a girl he loved, a reason he acknowledged as improper compared to any of Kuz's concerns. To illustrate his point, Kenzaki showed Kuz a photo on his phone. The image depicted a younger, obese version of himself, starkly contrasting with his current slim and fit appearance. Kuz, taken aback, initially thought it was a picture of Kenzaki's younger brother. He was surprised to learn that the photo was indeed of Kenzaki during his ninth grade. Kenzaki, noticing Kuz's surprise, began to explain his transformation. Two years ago, he was struggling academically, unskilled in sports and generally disinterested in school. His life changed when he fell for Sarashina Chisaki, one of the most admired girls in their grade. Motivated by his feelings, Kenzaki worked tirelessly to improve himself, 
eventually becoming the student council president to prove himself worthy of being her boyfriend. Hughes, understanding the personal nature of Kenzaki's journey, listened as Kenzaki emphasized that having a suitable reason wasn't necessary for joining the student council. He pointed out that even Masha, affectionately referred to as Elder Kujo, had joined Ichizaki's request, though she had always been interested in student council activities. Masha added that what mattered was the contributions made while holding the position, whether motivated by love, friendship, or any other reason, as long as it led to positive outcomes for the students. Kuz considered these perspectives recalling his own experience as a vice president in middle school, where he supported Yuki's campaign for student council president. Though he initially resisted, Yuki's insistence had drawn him into a role that ultimately helped him grow. Kenzaki reassured Kuz that his reasons for joining the student council even if to support someone else's leadership were valid. He encouraged Kuz to take his time deciding, offering an open invitation to join backed by the support of the current council members. As the conversation shifted, Kuz noticed an empty seat and inquired about Elisa's whereabouts. Kenzaki explained that Elisa was mediating a dispute between the baseball and soccer teams over field usage, as both teams needed the space for important events. Normally, Shizaki handled such disputes, but she was away on kendo club business, so the responsibility fell to Elisa, who was finding the task challenging. Hughes decided to leave, planning to check on the situation with the sports teams concerned they might be in conflict. At the meeting between the soccer and baseball teams, Elisa Kujo stood between the two groups trying to mediate the tense situation. The leaders in both teams were silent, each waiting for the other to speak. The soccer team argued that having a home advantage was crucial for their game, while the baseball team insisted they had scheduled their matches months in advance, even their annual nature. The conversation quickly became heated. One soccer player dismissed the baseball games as mere friendly matches, sparking an angry retort from a baseball player. Eliza, sensing the escalation, attempted to calm everyone, emphasizing that insults would not lead to a resolution. She proposed using a nearby Riverside Park for practice, which had facilities for both sports. However, this suggestion only fueled further contention, the baseball team, adamant about the importance of their upcoming game for their futures, resisted the idea, pointing out that the soccer field at the Riverside Park wasn't suitable for their needs. The soccer team, in turn, argued that they were better equipped to use the school field due to the larger size of their team. The situation grew more chaotic as both sides refused to compromise, each accusing the other of selfishness. Despite Elisa's repeated calls for calm, the teams continued their heated exchange, ignoring her attempts to mediate. She felt her influence slipping away at a realization that struck her deeply. Internally, Elisa struggled with a sense of inadequacy and isolation. Her previous experiences had led her to distance herself from others, believing that self-reliance was the only way to avoid disappointment. Now faced with a situation where her voice went unheard, she felt the weight of her choices. Tears welled up in her eyes as she confronted the reality of her isolation. In a moment of vulnerability, Elisa quietly spoke in Russian, a language familiar and comforting to her, asking for help. She felt alone, overwhelmed by the situation and unsure of how to reach out to those around her. As tensions rose between the soccer and baseball teams, Kuz Masachika arrived outside the meeting room. Inside, the teams were embroiled in a heated argument, unable to find common ground. Kuz felt that Elisa Kujo, who was trying to mediate, was in a tough spot. He believed the situation might be too intense for her to handle alone, thinking it could still be a valuable learning experience for her. As Kuz considered leaving, he overheard Elisa speaking in Russian, her voice tinged with desperation as she quietly pleaded for help. Realizing that she felt isolated, he decided to step in. Whispering in Russian, he reassured her. Hughes then entered the room, introducing himself as a member of the student council responsible for general affairs. His unexpected arrival caught everyone's attention, especially Elisa's, who seemed relieved to see him. The members of the baseball team recognized him from his past role as a vice president in middle school, lending him some authority. Hughes quickly summarized the issue at hand the dispute over the use of the school field versus the Riverside Park. He proposed that the baseball team, being smaller in number, could practice at the Riverside Park, while the soccer team with more members could assist with the logistics of the move. This suggestion initially sparked resistance from both sides, with members voicing their displeasure. However, Cues remained calm and observant, focusing on a female soccer team member. His steady gaze seemed to encourage her to speak up. After a brief silence, she proposed that the soccer team managers could help the baseball team, a suggestion that seemed to bridge the gap between the two groups. The idea was quickly supported by others, including the baseball team who appreciated the gesture. With both teams agreeing to the terms, the tension in the room eased. Cues instructed them to formalize their agreement with the student council the next day. As the meeting concluded, Elisa looked at Cues with admiration. 
After the meeting, Qs and Elisa walked together, reflecting on the events that had just unfolded. Qs felt the need to apologize for his intervention, acknowledging that he might have undermined Elisa's efforts. However, Elisa reassured him, curious about the reasoning behind his proposal during the meeting. She had noticed how Qs had focused on a particular soccer team manager, seemingly anticipating her response. Qs explained that the manager was dating the captain of the baseball team, a relationship that had become a popular topic among students. He noted that the baseball captain had remained silent throughout the meeting, likely because he was torn between his duties and his desire to support his girlfriend. The manager, aware of the demands the soccer team was making, had been hesitant. Qs had anticipated that she would offer to help seeing it as a way to bridge the divide between the teams. Elisa recognized that Qs's strategy had been effective in resolving the conflict. The baseball team benefited from having additional help, the soccer team secured the use of the school field, and the couple involved had a way to spend time together across club lines. It was a solution that addressed multiple issues at once. As they continued walking, they encountered Kenzaki, the student council president, who inquired about the outcome of the meeting. Elisa praised Qs for his role in resolving the situation, and Kenzaki commended her for her perseverance. Qs, slightly teasing Kenzaki, suggested that the president might have anticipated the need for his intervention all along. Finally, Kenzaki asked Qs if he had made a decision about joining the student council. Qs confirmed that he had decided to join, expressing his honor at becoming a member. Kenzaki welcomed him warmly, pleased to have him on board. As night fell, Qs and Elisa walked home together, reflecting on the day's events. Qs couldn't shake the feeling that he had been manipulated into joining the student council, but he accepted his fate. He recalled the moment Kenzaki handed him the student council application form, instructing him to fill it out and return it the next day since it was getting late. Elisa, curious about Qs's intentions, questioned whether he was truly joining the student council and if his motivation was to stand alongside Su San in the presidential election. Qs, contemplating her question, asked what she would do if he were to run for president. Elisa firmly stated her determination to become student council president, even if it meant competing against him. Recognizing her unwavering drive, Qs reassured her that he would support her ambition. He promised to help her achieve her goal and vowed to ensure she would never be alone in her efforts. He extended his hand to her, inviting her to join him as a team. Moved by his words, Elisa, with tears in her eyes, accepted his hand. Elisa expressed her gratitude in Russian, saying she loved him. Qs was taken aback, his mind racing with memories of a childhood friend with whom he used to speak Russian. His surprise and distraction were apparent, and Elisa noticed, tightening her grip on his hand. Elisa, sensing Qs's thoughts wandering, pressed him for an explanation. Qs caught off guard, admitted he was thinking about another girl, leading to a moment of tension between them. Elisa, hurt and upset, slapped Qs playfully but firmly, insisting that he focus on their shared commitment. As Qs and Elisa continued their walk home, Qs commented on the unexpected experience of being slapped, joking that it had somehow made him more mature. Elisa teased him, asking if he had hurt his head when he fell, which Qs dismissed with a lighthearted assurance that his brain was functioning just fine. Elisa, with a hint of playful sarcasm, remarked on Qs's self-described state of mind, suggesting that barely functioning was his default. This led Qs to remind her, in a mock-offended tone, of his reputation as a child prodigy. Elisa responded with incredulity, clearly skeptical of his claim. When they arrived at front of Elisa's home, she noticed Qs rubbing his cheek and asked if he needed ice. Qs reassured her that he was fine, joking that he couldn't feel anything on the left side of his face. Elisa, concerned, pointed out that it didn't sound fine, to which Qs quickly clarified that he was kidding, and that it only stunned a little. In an unexpected gesture, Elisa kissed him on the cheek. Qs stood there, momentarily stunned, his mind racing. He wondered if it was just a friendly gesture, as cheek kisses usually are, or if there was more to it. Elisa simply smiled and said goodbye, leaving him standing there. He couldn't help but replay the moment in his mind, desperately wishing he knew what it meant. As Elisa lay in bed, she couldn't stop thinking about her conversation with Qs. She rolled it over, speaking softly to herself in Russian, I love you, then questioned the words, wondering if she truly felt that way about Qs. Elisa quickly dismissed the thought, convincing herself that she had only been caught up in the moment. She reasoned that her priority should be becoming the student council president and living up to Qs's expectations. The idea of confessing her feelings and being rejected made her feel anxious. Meanwhile, Masha arrived home, cheerful and energetic. She greeted Elisa and excitedly shared that she had met someone wonderful, revealing a plushie she had named Alienian. Elisa was baffled by the resemblance Masha claimed it had to her, but Masha insisted it was in the expression. The conversation shifted to Qs, with Masha teasingly suggesting that Elisa might be in love with him. Elisa denied it, but Masha playfully encouraged her to confess her feelings before someone else did. 
This is the end of Alia sometimes hides her feelings in Russian episode 4. Thank you so much for staying in this channel and watching our videos. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so we can keep you updated with our latest contents. See you in the next video.